So we heard this scripture this morning, a little snippet. How are we to respond to this story? Clearly, we cannot take this short vignette about a bunch of people wandering in the wilderness and make anything out of it. I mean, really? I mean, the whole congregation of the Israelites? Who are they anyway? If only we had died in Egypt, what were they doing there in the first place? Who is this Moses and Aaron? And for that matter, who is the Lord that seems to have the fate of this people in his hands? What can we make of this as an isolated story? Not much. Now, well, of course, we all know that the story of the children of Israel complaining in the desert is but one minuscule sequence in a much longer narrative about God and God's people that helps to characterize God as one who hears and answers the complaints of the people and who cares for them in all ways. Let's take a quick look at the larger narrative. Yeah, it begins at creation of the universe. The moon and the stars and all the earth, the animals and ultimately humans. You heard that in the anthem. The story traces the development of the relationship between God and creation paying particular attention to the growth of the human family. The story becomes personal with Abraham and Sarah. You know, Sarah who laughed out loud when she heard that she was supposed to have a baby in her old age. But she did, by the grace of God. She named him Isaac. Or Sarah who dismissed her servant Hagar out of jealousy when Hagar bore another of Abraham's son named Ishmael. Hagar went into the desert. The story continues with Isaac and his wife Rebekah, who, although she was barren, gave birth to twin sons, Esau and Jacob. And then Jacob became the father of 12 sons, 10 by Leah, the wife he really didn't want. And Joseph was his favorite son because his mother was Rachel, the woman that Jacob really wanted as his wife. And Joseph was sent to Egypt by the jealous brothers, and there he grew to be a powerful figure. And from that, one person grew a large Hebrew presence in Egypt, and Joseph's family came to Egypt looking for food and ended up staying and becoming slave laborers for the Egyptian pharaohs. Then along came Moses, who was born to a Hebrew woman but was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Hmm. Moses saw the plight of his people, committed murder, and ran from Egypt. And after a time, God sent Moses and his brother Aaron back to Egypt to bring the Israelites out of bondage, they were released by Pharaoh and left Egypt through the Sea of Reeds. And now, freed from their unbearable workload and spared from the whip of the overlords, we find them wandering in the desert. And they are hungry and thirsty and grumpy getting on each other's nerves, complaining to Aaron and to Moses that they would rather be back in Egypt, that they would rather die in their labor with full stomachs than die of hunger in the wilderness. But Moses, who is still in contact with the God of Abraham, brings the complaints of the people of his God. And what does God say? Don't worry. I'll send you some bread. I'll send you some quail. I'll find you some water. And I do this so you will know who brought you out of Egypt, so you will see the glory of your God. 
And so it was that the God of Abraham cared for his people in the desert with bread and meat and water for 40 years to be continued. Who writes this stuff? Amazing. So, again, how do we respond to this larger story? We could read it as an historical narrative that happened in a given time and place. We could dig into all the archaeological information and read up on the latest biblical scholarship and come up with a picture in our minds about what life looked like for the children wandering in the wilderness as contrasted with their life in Egypt. Unfortunately, all I'm getting is a cast of thousands led by Charlton Heston in a long striped robe carrying a tall staff. Or it might lead us to the conclusion that the congregation of the Israelites had a God who cared for them enough to travel with them back and forth across the land, leading them by fire and cloud and providing food and water with the promise that they will one day reach a land they can call their own. In reading the whole story, we can get the idea that their God is faithful and ever-present, although never seen. We can see the development of a relationship between the people and their God. And when we read the longer narrative beyond the wandering in the wilderness, this relationship gets developed even more clearly and a culture emerges in the Jewish faith, a faith that has historical roots in the ancient Near East and is practiced still today. The hymn that we sang at the beginning of the service is a simple Jewish hymn of praise derived from the 13 articles of the Jewish faith codified in the 12th century and formed into the Yigdal, or the doxology, in the 14th century. The hymn points to the one and only truth, who was and is and is to be, is still the same. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus quoted these words from Exodus, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But Jesus comments, he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. And the hymn proclaims the eternal nature and steadfast love of the living God. Likewise, it affirms that the word of God spoken to the prophets of old still speaks afresh to us and to all generations to come. But what does it say to us? If we read these stories through the lens of logos, we would pay attention to the historic details, the plot of the story, who did what to whom, what happened from the beginning to the end. And seeing it in that way, we might limit the larger impact that these scriptures would have on our lives. And we might fail to internalize their true meaning. I'd like to share a word about logos and mythos provided by Karen Armstrong in her book, The Case for God. In most pre-modern cultures, there were two recognized ways of thinking, speaking, and acquiring knowledge. The Greeks called them mythos and logos, but both were essential and neither was considered superior to the other. Logos was the pragmatic mode of thought that enabled people to function effectively in the world, corresponding to external realities. Logos was forward-looking for new ways of living. Logos was essential to the survival of the species, but it could not assuage human grief or find ultimate meaning in human struggles. For that, people turned to mythos. 
Today we live in a society of scientific logos and mythos has fallen into disrepute. In the past, myth helped people to live effectively in our confusing world. Myths focused on aspects of the human predicament that lay outside the realm of logos. When the myth told the epic stories of heroes, these were not understood as primarily factual stories. They were designed to help people go deep into their inner thoughts. People were invited to go inside and fight their own personal demons. A myth was never intended as an accurate account of a historical event. It was something that had in some sense happened once, but that also happens all the time. A myth was a program of action. It could put you in the correct spiritual posture, but it was up to you to take the next step and make the truth of the myth a reality in your life. So, if we take the literary route with this massive narrative that we have and let this story speak to us as mythos, what might it say? We might be able to abandon our image of a god who is a white male with long white hair and a flowing beard who rules the world from a place up in heaven, handing out punishments to people stepping out of line, and replace it with a being of spirit, a being of love that is comprised of energy. And like the song says, who was and is and is to be is still the same. And that energy is what formed the universe and that energy is what created the world. And it is that energy that brought forth the vegetation and the animals and eventually humans. And the stories that we encounter in the scriptures and other ancient writings are the attempts of humans to understand that mystery. And all the while, God is walking with us on our journey knowing that what we do in our, in our discovering will have painful consequences. That we will initially think of only ourselves and see only our own little world and complain when we don't get what we want and that many things will happen in our lives that defy logic. But God's creative energy never stops. Since we are one with God and each other, sharing in that same energy, God compels us to grow and develop as we wander in the desert of our lives. Along the way, we will find quail in the evening and manna in the morning dew. We will see water gushing from rocks and we might be grateful eventually. And when we are truly grateful, the deserts in our minds will open up and produce flowers and grasses and little creatures. And we will grow together as a society and discover that when we trust ourselves and each other and God, we can leave our deserts and cross the river into a land that will be free of violent acts that destroy our inner being. We will find that the bodies that craved meat and bread and couldn't live without water are now at home with the spiritual blessings of the God who lives and moves and has its being within us. We will be aware of the depth and breadth of God's sustaining love and mercy. We who yearn for days of fullness will find that food is all around us. We will taste and see that God is good. We will experience abundance. And we will raise our voices in one great unison and declare, there is none like you. 
That's where the myth can take us. If we set aside our fear of being wrong and acknowledge the truth that we are right. We are right because the God we praise, the God who led the people out of bondage and through wilderness and wandering, this God with whom we are one continues to make us in his image. And we, each one of us, is part of that making. Amen.